Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, video about the rise of China. This is a POS 300, a response to some of your questions, some of your more popular questions. Uh, the first one I want to do uh, was the most popular question, it had 47 upvotes. And the quote goes like this, it says, China should never give in while defending its core interests. Only when it comes to non-core interests should it make some compromise in order to ease the pressure on other big powers. Um, I, I believe that this uh, part of it is a is a, a reference to Chinese policy to uh, to thinkers in China about what uh, what sort of role China should play in the world. I remember this week um, uh, that sort of our focus is, is the rise of China. I think I said in my introduction video we've been talking for a long time about what sort of role China's rising. It's becoming more and more powerful. It's becoming identified as a superpower. It's becoming almost, uh, well, according to Breslin, dragged sort of kicking and screaming into the uh, sort of realm of superpower status. Um, and so, you know, what sort of what sort of international order can we expect with China, uh, either as a sort of co superpower with the United States or um, uh, uh, taking over from the United States as as the sole power, uh, the sole superpower, uh, which seems to me a, a long way off, uh, uh, and, and perhaps um, uh, not not for me unrealistic. Okay, so uh, so, so this is uh, something that Breslin is identifying as a possible uh, outcome, where that China doesn't give in in its core interests, but it does. Uh, give in on its non-core interests uh, and then uh, it says this according to the white paper on China's peaceful development these core interests can be defined as including state sovereignty national security territorial integrity and national reunification China's political system established by the Constitution and overall social st stability and the basic safeguards for ensuring sustainable economic and social development uh, and, and thank you for putting the page number on there, page 623, paragraph 2. Question, and here's the question. To what extent is the global community supposed to accept Chinese human rights, human rights abuses that they may see as essential to their core interests? Um, and I think you've really encapsulated uh, maybe perhaps the biggest, uh, broadest, maybe more significant um, sort of worry and, and, and clash that's going on here with the rise of China. So we've got, uh, on the one hand, uh, a status quo, a current international environment where the United States in particular, but Western European countries as well, um, something that we've sort of come to, to call the, uh, the global community, right, uh, sees uh, very much a role for itself in defending human rights across the, across the globe. Uh, to the point where, and there's a lot of examples of this, right? To the point where, you know, uh, we, uh, and, and by we, I think I mean Western liberal states uh, like the United States, like Britain, uh, perhaps France and Germany to a slightly lesser extent, um, um, when I, it's a, it's quite a, quite a short list when I say it out loud, um, you know, and, and it's very much perhaps uh, much much more associated with the United States than uh, and probably Great Britain than, 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 than anybody else in the world but um, the current the, the current system seems to have the United States and her allies uh, defending human rights wherever they are uh, violated uh, such as in Libya with Colonel Gaddafi in, in Iraq right under Saddam Hussein uh, in, in, in perhaps Syria though to a much less successful and less um, a lesser extent with, with Russian involvement and that sort of thing, um, with, with Bashar al-Assad. We hear uh, talk of uh, human rights abuses in all sorts of different places, and we wonder, in Venezuela, for example, and we, we wonder, we ask ourselves, um, American, for, uh, American foreign policy establishment asks themselves, should we intervene, right? With, with, with the expectation that it is our responsibility to intervene everywhere where, where there are human rights abuses. Uh, and certainly this, this, this question has that uh, as its basis, right? The current, uh, and that's, that's the current status quo. And that's something that it, it looks like China, uh, the rise of China, which it's telling, 
let's look again at these core interests that it defines as, as its core interest, state sovereignty. State sovereignty is very often used as a sort of a counterbalance to this uh, international human rights, international law, uh, sort of status quo situation where the United States says, hey, there's no, uh, there's no sovereignty, right? There's no borders when it comes to international rights. If you're abusing your own people, I uh, remember responsibility to protect. I think we talk about this later in the semester. Uh, certainly I have in other semesters. I can't remember if I, uh, I adjust the topics depending on what's current, but, um, you know, responsibility to protect, right? It's this idea that, hey, every, you know, in the first instance, every state, every nation state has the responsibility to protect the rights of its own people. And so, um, if they're not, and this is what responsibility to protect says, if they're not um, looking after their own people and, and defending their human rights, then it becomes the, the job of the international community, the UN, to have a response to that and to, to help them if they're either unwilling or unable uh, to, to, to prevent um, serious human rights abuses, then the international community is there to, to do that. Now that, that, that seems to uh, it tries to strike a balance, right, between state sovereignty, because it says in the, in the first instance it's it's the state's responsibility and international intervention. Okay, now we're going to intervene uh, because you can't or you won't uh, do it yourselves. Um, but of course, the, the, the sort of uh, what China generally says in those situations is, look, um, we value state sovereignty, right? This is the internal affairs of another nation state, an independent, sovereign nation state. And so they... they that that's always been a, a concern for China, right? That's a that's a core principle, and it, and it says its core interests, um, and it puts state sovereignty first. And I don't think that's an accident, right? Um, and so, yeah, when we think of that, uh, if China rises, if it becomes more powerful, if it gets its own way, then is it going to insist on state sovereignty not not just for itself, uh, but but for other states as well? Hey, that no interventions, right? No interventions around the world. That's an internal matter for that state. It's a sovereign state. That's their own political uh, decisions that that, that uh, enjoy precedence in that realm, not the decisions of the United States or or, or Britain, I suppose, right, um, or anybody else for that matter, right? It's 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 for their own uh, government to to work out themselves in, in a way that they want to work that out. So, um, so yeah, I think in this question we do get that central question with the, of the rise of China is. Will China put an end? Can China, to what extent are they able to, and to what extent are they determined to um, prevent that uh, that uh, sort of um, that responsibility, sort of international community responsibility for protecting uh, human rights uh, throughout the globe? So, um, yeah, so the global community is supposed to expect. Except Chinese human rights abuses, yeah. and I think that's the biggest change that we might see. I think that's the most fundamental change that we might see if China becomes um, uh, much more assertive and much more capable of being assertive in the international uh, system. Are we already seeing that? Um, now certainly, Syria feels different from Iraq. It feels different from Libya. Um, China. Uh, China abstained from the, 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 the Security Council vote on action in Libya, and they, they so they abstained from that uh, to allow that to go ahead. Uh, well, I understand that they regretted that once we, they said, look, we abstained so that you can go in and, and, and save those current, th those people who were being sort of hemmed in, surrounded by uh, government forces and uh, you know, civilian deaths. We, 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 we agreed that you would prevent that. But you went further and you went for regime change. That's not what we envisioned. That's that's not what they expected. They, they I've heard, and so, and so now it looks unlikely that they would support. You know, not that they supported it in the past, but that they allowed it to happen right by abstaining. Uh, maybe they wouldn't do that again. Uh, and so, are we already at that point now? Right. Um, in that sense, uh, in the sense that China has been on the UN Security Council, that right, we might say that they've already right since 1945. Or, um, since since after the Second World War, they've been in a position to um, influence world affairs as they're a permanent member of the Security Council. Um, but as they become more more powerful, as they develop, uh, will they become more assertive in that role? 
uh, and will they use that to, to protect state, state sovereignty? Um, some of the other ones are interesting here, right? Uh, national security, I think, uh, for me, is the least interesting because that's that's everybody, right? I mean, every state wants that. For me, at least, is the sort of the primary purpose, uh, the primary goal of all of the states. Because without national security, you can't really do anything else uh, as a nation state. Uh, if you don't exist anymore, right? If you're not secure in yourself, what can you really do? Um, so that's the least interesting one for me. That seems like every every state would have that. The next one, territorial integrity, uh, that's very interesting, right? Because of course, what do we think straight away when we see territorial integrity? Uh, in the case of China, we think um, Taiwan, um, and we think uh, Tibet probably second um, uh, in those. And recently, we start to think about um, the South China Sea, which they assert is their own territory, right? Their own sea. So, um, and building those those islands there, those man-made islands on the in the South China Sea in order to really uh, buttress their claims to it as, as sovereign national territory. So, um, and then of course national reunification, which is which if territorial integrity doesn't shout Taiwan at you, national reunification uh, should scream Taiwan uh, to you. Uh, and then China's political system established by the constitution and overall social stability. Um, uh, and in there is something I think as well quite interesting. That if that's one of the the stability, right? I guess they're saying social stability, and and they're, they're suggesting suggesting internal stability, um, you know, ensuring sustainable economic and social development. And I think that that should also those those things also make us think of. Um, something else that Breslin's talking about, right? When he, when he's trying to, to to sort of paint the picture of China as a reluctant, as a reluctant superpower, as a reluctant participant in in global affairs, uh, one of the things he says is, look, you know, they they still have, and, and this is a little bit old, but it's you know it's still still relevant. Um, you know, they, they have 150 million people in in, in abject poverty here, right? Uh, that's their first. You know, the, the, their first concern is internal, right? Is is in developing uh, an economy that can sustain such a large population and, and that can lift these people out of poverty. And China's uh, been very successful. And this is another, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of the question uh, because there's other questions that, that will help us to deal with that too. But uh, but yeah. So to what extent is the global community supposed to accept Chinese human rights abuses? Uh, I'm not really answering the question, am I? <laughs> because I, of course it's a normative question that 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 sort of asks, asks for an opinion, uh, and it's an interesting one. Uh, but as I say, it does get at the heart of, of what, what the rise of China means. Um, and I think to sort of dodge the question and make, make my own question out of it, uh, I think I would say that you know, to what extent uh, are we supposed to accept it, but uh, we being, I think, the West, and I think especially the United States, to what extent are we supposed to ex accept it? Accept it. To what extent will we have to accept it? I think is is another thing. Um, you know, there's already more things that we can't. There's already the list of things that we can't really force China to do. It seems to be growing, um, and I think that will continue to grow for the foreseeable future. Certainly, China. Uh, if you look at the correlates of war, maybe I'll pop this up here. I'll find it online. You can find it, I think, even on Wikipedia. But uh, there's a correlate of war database. Some of the data they collect is on the power of states. Uh, and they define power in a certain way, and they, they, they measure it. And it's to do with, with three factors that they split into two uh, each. But the three factors are population, uh, military. Military, they split into sort of the size of the military as well as the, the amount of spending uh, on the military. The population is overall population and, and rural population. And then the other one is, is economy, and they, they, they split that into uh, two. Uh, let's see if I can remember the two. I never can for the economy. One of them is um, the uh, uh, steel consumption. I think it's a, is it steel production. Steel production, let's say. Um, but it might be consumption. The other one is, well, the other one could be energy consumption. And that's why maybe I'm getting them mixed up. Anyway. But on that measure of power, check if, if for full details uh, and accurate details about which economic measures they use, check out the correlates of war 
uh, database and look look at the, the material capabilities index. And, and I'll put the graph, I'll find the graph and I'll pop it up there for you. Uh, and, and you'll see, what you'll see is that the, the Chinese power, uh, as measured in that particular way, is already exceeding that of the United States. Now, uh, of course, part of that is the fact that they have a massive population. Right? Uh, Population they split into overall population and the urban population because they say rural populations. Uh, 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 what is it? Is it uh, is it Lenin or somebody says uh, it was a Russian definitely uh, from the Soviet Union. Somebody said you know you, you can't win anything with peasants. You know you can't win a war with peasants. Uh, and the correlates of war database take that uh, seriously and say okay if it's people living in the country, uh, they count for less than people living in the in the city who are perhaps more educated, to have better access to healthcare, healthier people, um, uh, and more able, sort of more, more uh, connected uh, to the national network, more, um, you know, more um, trainable, perhaps. Right. Anyway, uh, that's a little bit of an aside. So, but, 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 but we're talking about sort of the measurement of power, which is interesting. Uh, Correlates of what China is already up there. So, to what it's so sorry, this is again me. So I'm adjusting the question to suit my own needs a little bit, but you know, to what extent would we be even able to stop them from doing it? We couldn't stop them from building um, these man-made islands in the in in the South China Sea. Uh, yeah, sure, we've we've been uh, sending our ships through the South China Sea just to sort of thumb our nose at them a little bit and to sort of maintain our position that these are international waters. Uh, but ultimately, you know, they, they they didn't listen to us when we told them to stop building the, the islands. Um, you know. I think um, probably 15 years ago, if you'd have asked me, could China militarily retake Taiwan without a U.S. reaction? I think I would have uh, been high. I, I think I would have thought no. I think now uh, I, I feel like it. From and this is just my own uh, opinion, but I think that it would be highly unlikely that we would uh, go to war with China over Taiwan at this point. So. So it does seem like Chinese power is increasing, it. and the, and so in terms of accepting Chinese human rights abuses, I think that was already a long a long time ago. It was already something that we weren't really able to to to, to impact, at least in China itself. Uh, but what we have been able to do up to now is to um, to uphold and enforce human rights norms uh, that we see as important uh, in the rest of the world. Um, as China grows more powerful. Is that going to prevent us? And I think that's the that's the question. So quite a, quite a while on that question. I hope that that uh, I hope that that was useful. Uh, but but uh, certainly think about it as a as a potential um, a potential essay question in the midterm, uh, and then uh, we've covered some ground there that you could also uh, I think cover and uh, and 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 connect back to Breslin uh, quite easily because I think all most of that one that I said I took just from Breslin. Okay. Uh, the second question is this: the second most popular one, I think, uh, with thirty, uh, with 30, um, 30 upvotes, is this one. Others are searching for a set of Chinese norms and values that might be the source of a new universal world order led by China, and that's what we just spent time discussing. I think, right? We just spent time discussing those those norms and values: state sovereignty, national security, territorial integrity, national reunification. Uh, and I suppose if that's good for China, right? If China thinks that's good for us to be reunited nationally, they might they might well think that that's good for other countries too. Um, territorial integrity, you know, uh, what might they they if, if if they had a say on Spain and on the on Catalonia, you know, what might they say? They might say uh, territorial integrity. We want Spain uh, to stay together. Right? We we don't want to support the Catalans. Uh, bid for independence. Um, Trying to think of some other cases now. Right? Would they have split South Sudan from Sudan? Would they have allowed that? Would they would they have tried to keep that together? So so there are there are implications that that this this would be uh, uh, yes important for China itself, but China might find that important for other countries as well around the world. And might uh, if it were to become more assertive and more capable in an international sphere, might push um, international foreign policy uh, in a particular direction. Uh, so uh, others are searching for a set of Chinese norms and values, right? Uh, the ones we just talked about, that might be the source of a new universal world order led by China, a new hegemony that reproduces China's hierarchical empire for the 21st century. Okay, hierarchy. 
Uh, if China decides to step up and take the role of the United States, will it promote communism in the world once again? And I like this question. Um, and I find it, I find it really telling uh, that in that white paper that we just read a, a little bit from through Breslin, um, you know, what were the core interests? Uh, the core interests of state. So I'm saying them again. I'm sorry, but these are important: state sovereignty, national security, territorial integrity, and national re reunification. China's political system. It's way down the list. China's political system. Uh, established by the Constitution and overall social stability. So, so not only is it quite far down the list, there's a few other things. One, it doesn't mention communism by name. It, it says um, China's political system, which we, you and I know is sort of communism, I suppose, but, but we'll talk more about how communist it really is. Uh, so it doesn't say communism. It says political system established by the Constitution. Right? And overall social stability, making me think that really it's the stability uh, that they are most interested in, in, in keeping. Um, let's say, uh, I think that China, you know, certainly the Chinese Communist Party is in charge of China. Uh, certainly uh, there is uh, nominal communism uh, in China. I think, e I think if I think of communism as an economic system, in terms of centrally planned, um, uh, economic system with government run enterprises um, that are put into service of, I won't say of the working class which I want to say but uh, put in the service of the state I'll say that instead right um, China's not there anymore uh, since, the nine, since about 1980 1979, 1980 uh, China's economy has liberalized um, very seriously. And, um, you know, what's happened since 1980 is China's, China's become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. It's lifted more and more of its people out of poverty by adopting, um, and I'm not a huge liberal in, in terms of economics, uh, but but it, it, when I look at China, it, 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 that's as close to a liberal as I, as I can get, I think. Right? I look and I say, look, uh, they, they've lifted all these people out of poverty. You, know, you see that you know, very impressive cities that are, that, are, that are springing up, right? The urbanization. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing um, is, is, is down to, uh, you know, your own personal view. But, but um, it, that was their goal, and they achieved it through the liberalization of their economy, right? Through free international trade. Um, it talks about, in the Breslin piece, it talks about the economy, and it talks about the Chinese... Uh, the Chinese state-run industries, big uh, Chinese state-run industries. So, so not only is the smaller industries or smaller businesses that, that are not state-run, but uh, sort of liberal, operating in a liberal market system. But it, it talks about these big state-run enterprises, right? That might be more characteristic of, of sort of centrally planned communist societies. And they say, look, uh, they 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 actually, when in the international sphere, maybe at home they behave. As sort of state-run um, industries that are, that are trying to implement a government, uh, a state policy, right? It, at home they do that, but he says abroad they don't do that. Abroad they find themselves in different environments uh, when when they start to, to 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 deal internationally, and their interests diverge from one another, right? So instead of having a, a sort of a coherent state state policy, state-run businesses all trying to to work together in towards a set of goals, their interests start to diverge once they start to uh, trade internationally. And so uh, I think what Breslin's getting at here and what he wants to highlight is, is um, you know, not only did they de deliberately and, and, and publicly and, and, and uh, move away from sort of centrally planned communist economy in, the in 1980, not only did they do that, but even so, so they've moved towards away from that. But they've moved away from that. But even the, the elements that still exist are themselves sort of taking them further and further away. Uh, it, you know, the, the thing that always and they talk about the Soviet Union in this uh, t these terms as well. But 
Uh, it's like the, the you know the sorcerer's apprentice, right, where he unleashes these forces from the nether the, the, the netherworld. A liberal market economics. It's a little bit poetic, maybe for liberal market economics. Uh, they release these uh, forces from the netherworld, that, but uh, you know, and they think that they can control them. They think, oh, we can move a little bit away from central planned economy, but as soon as they, they make those steps away, uh, they they take on a life of their own, right? These these uh, companies, right? The the market itself, I suppose, takes on a life of its own and drags them further and further away. So I think at this point. Uh, certainly, economically, China is very, um, uh, very far away from a from a communist, and they've done very well by it. They've done very well by liberalizing their market economy. And so, uh, my my preference, right, my inclination is that uh, China would not promote communism in the in the world once again. I think the Chinese Communist Party uh, recognizes has to recognize. I, I think. That um, the, the 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 thing that's brought them to the, the world stage, the thing that's brought them out of poverty, uh, back to, to to greatness, right, is their their adoption, the, their their abandonment of of uh, at least sort of traditional centrally planned uh, communist ways. Now, uh, socially, politically, um, you know, we've talked about state sovereignty in the last question. Uh, the uh, national security, right? Uh, sustainable social development and also social stability. Social stability, when I hear that from, from China, I think of uh, sort of the political illiberalism, uh, social illiberalism that they have, uh, that, that they maintain in China. Uh, a lot of economists uh, thought as they liberalized their economy that the, that the, the, the you know, middle class would develop uh, as it did in the West, where middle class develops and then and then the, those middle class people they become wealthier and they demand uh, more political freedoms, more 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 liberal society, uh, and, and they eventually win. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be the case in China, uh, at least from from my perspective, it doesn't seem to be the case. It doesn't seem to be happening like that. They still maintain uh, quite a high level compared to what what we would find acceptable in the West, uh, a high level of, of social control and a low level of, of political liberty. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm speaking very generally in those terms because, you know, we, we, when it comes to measures, uh, I, I never find any of the measures of that sort of thing very, very convincing. But, but uh, I think generally we can say that. Uh, and so, uh, it, my expectation is that the, the Chinese norms and values that, that that value social stability and value uh, state sovereignty. You know, you do what you want over there. Let us do what we want over here. They're the ones that, that could come into the forefront. But I think communism as an economic system, I think it's not something that China, uh, it, I don't think it served China very well. Uh, and I don't think it, it would be something that they would really espouse and, and try to, to promote it around the world um, as an economic system, at least. Maybe social stability, right? And, and fewer political liberties. That, that might be something that they want to promote. Uh, let's go on now to uh, this one. It says, as money, commodities, and even diseases can move between countries with relative speed. This is very timely, right? Uh, very timely question indeed. It is simply not possible to deal with issues that affect a country, any country, through unilateral action alone. Over the past 20 years, SARS, H7N9, avian flu, and now COVID-19 have originated from China. As such, should China be looking to expand their influence in the global health sector? and look to become more preemptively involved in multilateral health organizations, such as the World Health Organization, uh, and look to take more of a leadership role. Yes, I know the Chinese have become, uh, the Chinese government have, have protested, you know, when, when President Trump has uh, uh, referred to China as the origin of, of, of the disease. Um, frequently as, he, as he's done that, and, uh, and they've protested, and they threw out uh, American journalists from the New York Times. Uh, which I found a little bit uh, ironic, right? Considering the New York Times would not would be the last people I would imagine that would really support uh, Trump in that. And so you're sort of hurting. I don't know. <laughs> it's almost like they got together and decided this. Uh, we, we'll offend you, and in order to sort of get retaliate at us, uh, throw my enemies in, in the press out of your country. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, should they be looking to expand their influence in the global health sector? 
I, I like that, that. I like the question. I think it's an interesting question. I think it's a very timely question. Um, and I think it's interesting from the point of view of of China playing a more. Uh, and when I think about them in the World Health Organization, I think look, you know, China, uh, and we mentioned this earlier. China's already, uh, and this is something that Breslau talks about quite a lot. Uh, China's already very integrated in, 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 into the international system. Uh, they're, you know, they're already in the UN, right? Certainly they're in the UN. Uh, not only are they in the UN, but they're a permanent member of the UN Security Council, you know, the World Health Organization. Um, I probably should have checked this, but right? I, I mean, they're, they're so integrated that I, I, I assume that they're, they're, they're part of the World Health Organization. Uh, 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 and I'll check that after this video to... To, make, to, to see if I can find anything about how involved they are uh, with that. that. That's an interesting question. Uh, um, but um, I guess I see the question, it, it's an, I guess I see it in terms of China being engaged and influential in the world generally. Uh, and so there being a choice for China as, as to whether to uh, concentrate, because this is something Breslin, com uh, Breslin uh, discusses, uh, you know, China, are they, China are reluctant to be involved, more involved in the international system uh, because of the problems that they have at home and because of the, the, you know, the, the, they're still growing, they're still developing, right? they, they, they change the you know, peaceful rise, the, you know, the alter to peaceful, peaceful development. Right? We, um, they they're careful not to get themselves. It reminds me of the United States in in, in, in the early history of the United States. Right, the, China China doesn't want to get itself entangled in international affairs. It doesn't want to, according to Breslin, take positions on international uh, issues because it doesn't want to because it, it worries that getting itself entangled in international affairs, getting itself uh, taking positions, taking strong positions one way or the other. It's going to make itself enemies, right? The, the, Breslin talks about balancing and bandwagoning, uh, which are realist uh, sort of terms for international politics, right? Uh, as as a state becomes more and more powerful, what what can happen? What realists think will happen is that alliances of countries uh, who might be threatened by the rise of this hegemon will, will will form. Countries will band together because they'll realize, you know, if, if we think of the and the Philippines is a, is a, is a counter example, but if we think of, I'm trying to think of sort of Southeast Asian countries, right? If we think of, um, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, La Laos, uh, you know, the Philippines, uh, probably Japan as well, right? If we think of the, which, you know, is, is not Southeast Asian, but is, is a neighbor of China. Uh, and actually I want to leave China, uh, Japan out because they're a little bit more powerful than these other Southeast Asian countries. So if we think of Southeast Asian countries, right? Individually on their own, they, they, they really can't stand up to China um, because they're not big enough or powerful enough. And so realists say right, they'll, they'll, they'll see the threat of the rise of China and they'll, they'll, they'll um, try and balance China right, by, by joining together. Um, what they'll also perhaps do right, is, is attempt to bring in uh, balancing uh, actors from other regions. Right? So, so perhaps the, the United States, right? they might try and bring in the, the United States. Uh, uh, because even together, right, Southeast Asia might not be a much of a counter to China. So, um, but China wants to stop that, right? Because that 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 they feel uh, would be harmful to their own development. Right? If if other countries around start to feel threatened, then they'll start banding together. They'll start doing trade deals with the United States that exclude China, and that will harm China's progression. So they so they want to do this in a, in a sort of a quietly, softly, friendly, peaceful way uh, to avoid that balancing. Uh, um, to avoid any kind of a perception of threat that will cause other countries to group together against them uh, and make it more difficult for them to, to develop. So with that sort of general background that I took from Breslin, I'm going to now try and apply it to, 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 to disease, right, which is sort of definitely the, the issue uh, going on right now. Um, but of course, I, I suppose when I try to do that, I start to think, well, if if China is seen as a threat in terms of the spread of disease, then surely uh, as part of that 
uh, peaceful rise, uh, that peaceful development, that, that let's prevent people from um, ganging up against us, right? let's stop them from balancing us, uh, you would think that they would definitely want to cooperate with other nations in, um, in, in eradicating these, these in controlling these diseases. Uh, and of course, uh, I think President Trump said yesterday that he's been on the phone with the Chinese and that the, that the Chinese government, the, the, the Chinese health experts have been very helpful to the United States in terms of their um, efforts to try and control uh, COVID-19. Um, and so again, I guess, uh, I guess the, the reason why I'm having a little bit of trouble uh, answering it is, is that I guess I don't know that they're not um, very involved in 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 trying to help other countries right now to, to halt the spread of COVID-19. Uh, they got a lot of praise in the beginning uh, because they they uh, they talked about it early. Now I notice they're getting um, China's getting a lot of flack for they knew even 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 before they started to let on that they knew. So that's obviously conflicting and, and opposite. Um, information but yeah I think uh, I also remember the hospitals that were, that were building and I think this might be another aspect of it right that another aspect of their peaceful development is that hey we don't want to spend too much money abroad we don't want to put too much of our resources out there we, we have the problem here at home you know, with those uh, what president talks about those 150 million uh, Chinese people living in poverty poverty so hey, we don't want to uh, spend our resources and our efforts out there because we have such a big problem here. And of course, with uh, if these uh, diseases are all uh, beginning in China or they're, they're hitting the Chinese uh, people the, the most heavily, then you you might that it might be in in uh, <clears throat> in harmony with what Breslin's saying there that that, that that yeah they will only use the resources uh, only for themselves. Uh, because they have the bigger problem, right? They, they might justify it that way. Hey, like our first concern is state sovereignty. Our first concern is social order within China, uh, not not in the world. So that that might be a good answer to the question if we if we accept the premise that they're not as involved in the international fight against these diseases uh, that you're saying in the question. So, uh, yeah, very uh, very timely question. Uh, one that caused me a little bit of uh, thought, a little bit of trouble, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed that. Hopefully, uh, though, in that we identified some parts of the Breslin article that we could bring in to answer a question uh, about that, uh, that we could bring COVID-19 into our uh, papers about the rise of China. I think that's a uh, absolutely interesting and, and timely issue to, to be thinking about in these terms. All right. And quite a long video at this point, I think. Well, we're only up to about 40 minutes until... Uh, I, I'll spend just a couple of minutes on this last question, which has six upvotes. It says, the key debate in China is whether and how it should abandon its previous principle of, of I'm, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, I don't speak Chinese, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Tao Wang Yanghui. Um, that's, that might be the first Chinese words I've ever heard it out loud. Uh, and take a more active global role. Its previous principle of, uh, and take a more active global role. But remember that principle, uh, and Breslin discusses it in, in his article. But what is it? I think that's the one where it says, uh, you know, uh, hide the bright and embrace obscurity. So, you know, the, the sort of taking a low profile right, in international affairs. Um, you know, again, with, the, with, with, I think, the aim, according to Breslin, of, of not making any enemies, right, and not having balancing, um, sort of keeping the peace. And that that inclination by China to do that, that must be encouraging to those who see China as a threat in some ways, right? That China doesn't want to rock the boat, right? That they're taking they're going through great pains uh, to not uh, to not to be allowed to develop, to be allowed to uh, you know, e develop economically, and to be uh, sort of left alone uh, and not balanced against. You know that that doesn't smack of um, revisionism, right? Uh, revisionist powers. Um, I think he, I think he mentions this about Barry Buzan and his status quo power versus revisionist power. Uh, it's one that I certainly. Uh, it, it's nice 
to, to apply these very broad uh, theories to, to the globe and kind of see where we fit in. But uh, if we think of a status quo power, those powers, those nation states who uh, simply uh, think that the way things are right now is, is the way things should stay. And then revisionist powers are just those who see themselves as uh, alienated by the current situation and want to make, I think, serious changes to it, right? Uh, who want to rock the boat, right? Who want to, in some ways, revolutionize uh, the way that we're, we're, we're conducting international affairs. Certainly, North Korea would seem to be a, re a revisionist power, uh, a good candidate for that. Uh, whether China are or not is, is definitely in question, right, in the Breslin article. Um, and so, uh, this this really gets gets into that. If, if China is not taking an active global role, uh, if it's uh, embracing obscurity, then do we have anything to worry about if we are indeed worried about a change in the status quo? Right? Do we have is that something that China's going to bring us, considering they benefited the most from it, uh, or, or one of the, the most economically that benefited greatly from the status quo? Uh, you know, they've been members of these international organizations, they've been full, strong participating members in, in the UN, for example. And so, is this the country that we're, we're worried about coming in and changing everything? Um, the country that's benefited the most from it? Uh, that's, that's definitely Breslin's uh, question, right? Anyway, after this quote, so the quote, I'll do it again. The key debate in China is whether and how it should abandon its previous principle of Tao Guang Yanghui and take a more active global role. After this quote, Breslin talks further about the concept of, I just put it in there again, uh, further about the concept of uh, Tao Guang Yanghui, I don't know if that's even close, and how the Tiananmen Square incident of 1989 made uh, China face possible international isolation. My question is, is China still reluctant to date to find a strategy to balance the pillars of self-interest, responsibility, and alliance building? Are there other lessons that the great powers can learn in an effort to obtain a more positive global role? I think I talk on my on my lecture videos. I have some videos at the bottom uh, that are from an old iteration of this course. I think, I, I think they're at the bottom on the modules page. And I think I talked there about uh, China's more active role in, in Africa. Um, so I, I think that they're less reluctant today. Uh, they're, they're certainly out there um, <clears throat> in the world. Uh, building alliances in Africa, in particular in, in Africa, very heavily involved in Africa, economically involved in Africa. They also built their first, I think their first military base uh, outside of China in Djibouti, I think. Uh, the, the video probably, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Djibouti. It's very close to a US base. Uh, there as well, you can see they can see each other from their their watchtowers, uh, which is quite nice. <clears throat> uh, they also have, I think this is in the video as well. They also have the the, the, the string of pearls, uh, sort of uh, fueling stations, if you like. Uh, that's what they were in the nineteenth century fueling stations. Now they're, I guess, naval bases, ports, friendly ports, uh, kind of all around the Indian Ocean. Uh, in Pakistan, I think there's one. I might have a map on that on that video. You might want to look at. Or just Google string of pearls, China, uh, you'll find that um, <clears throat> sort of places where uh, ports where Chinese uh, naval vessels can can uh, uh, go, right, and can 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 be um, accepted. Uh, and of course, Djibouti is round the other side of the Indian Ocean, and that's a that's a uh, an important base for them now, an important military base for them. Uh, and it's there, I think, ostensibly at least to uh, sort of battle piracy. In that part of the Indian Ocean, um, uh, which is near Somalia and all of that. Um, so yeah, China is definitely is engaging more, uh, but that's not quite the question that you're asking, is it? Uh, is it still reluctant today to find a strategy to balance the pillars of self-interest, responsibility, and alliance building? Maybe it is, right? Because we've got alliances in Africa, is what we're talking about. Responsibility, right, for, for global piracy, right, for piracy in the, in the Indian Ocean, yes. Uh, and certainly, um, I think when it comes to self-interest, it's it's hard for me at least to see any nation state that acting in any way that's not in a self-interested way. Uh, are there other lessons that the great powers can learn in an effort to obtain a more positive global role? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's 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 also a very normative question, which is which is totally fine and, and, and thought provoking. Uh, you know, is is China showing us the right way, right? Um, with uh, hegemonic theory, uh, and and I'm not a huge uh, uh, proponent of it, but but um, in hegemonic theory, right, or, or hegemonic uh, transfer, right, from from one hegemon to the next, uh, it's often said, right, that the last transfer from one hegemon to the other, right, was from from Great Britain to the United States, right, and it was a very peaceful transfer. Sort of peaceful. It took two world wars, right? But 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 Britain and the United States found themselves on the same side both times, uh, so they weren't fighting each other. Um, they were fighting other revisionist powers, right, like Nazi Germany and uh, well, and also and and, and uh, uh, sort of expansionist Germany during the First World War. Uh, it's not fair to call them expansionists when the British had a huge empire, right? But uh, you know, uh, they, they they were also going for the same thing, right, as, as Britain was. So. Um, but the, but that so so it was violent in, in terms of fighting other other revisionist powers. But but the U.S. and Britain were sort of a they were, they were both on the status quo side of things, right? So a handoff from Britain to the United States was uh, didn't entail a lot of change, I guess, on a global scale. I mean, it it, it maybe the biggest thing it did is, it, it, did is it, it it dismantled the British Empire. But probably the principles of the of the British Empire, free free trade, uh, and sort of a stable naval environment to to facilitate trade uh, are still very important to, to America and to the United States. So um, the, the, the principles didn't change a whole lot. You know, liberal political uh, system, uh, demo liberal, democrat liberal democracies, uh, capitalist, uh, free trade, uh, you know, the, the principles didn't, didn't change too much, even if the, the personnel switched from, from British personnel to to, to U.S. personnel, uh, and certainly, sort of the rhetoric around empire went away um, as well, right? So there, was, so there were some changes, but the, but the upheaval wasn't a great one uh, in 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 the literature on on hegemonic uh, cycles, right, or hegemonic um, theory. Uh, but sometimes people say, look, this was a special case, though, because they were both status quo powers and because they had sort of similar cultural and political backgrounds, you know, and a shared history, and even the language is the same, they say, so uh, it's not a big change. But a change from the United States to, to China would bring much more, um, much more upheaval, right? And, 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 and China is a revisionist power, say, say so, and China has these all these different uh, values, right, that we talked about at the beginning of this video. And so this would be a huge uh, difference. And that's what the Breslin's talking about, right? He said, no, no, no. Uh, China's benefited from the status quo. China's not given much of a, re a revisionist power. We don't have much to look to in terms of massive revolutionary changes that would come from, from a Chinese leadership in the world. Chinese, China doesn't even want to lead, says Breslin. They don't, that's not even what they want to do. Um, you know, they don't even perhaps at the beginning of the paper. You know, China doesn't even have a clear picture of what it sees itself doing. Right? Uh, it doesn't want the responsibility. It doesn't even know what it would do with it anyway. It just wants to, to develop internally, and the way it's developing internally is sort of by embracing the status quo. So, uh, so why would we worry? Uh, it could be the same handover from 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 the U.S. to China if if indeed that does ever occur. Uh, it would it, it would look like the handover from the handoff between Britain and the United States. Um, which is a British person, I find a little bit um, worrying. We always want to be sort of the special case, uh, especially when it comes to, to the United States, to relationships with the United States. We always want to be the, the special in the special relationship. Um, but but what if it's not special, right? What if uh, the handoff between Britain and, and to, to the United States would be exactly the same as the handoff between the United States and China, right? Uh, then Britain isn't special, uh, which is sad for me. But uh, but you know it's, it's probably better for the world overall in the, if we have a peaceful handoff. Uh, and one that doesn't really change the, the, the foundations of, of our international system that seem to be uh, helped. Of course, if, if you're of the opposite uh, persuasion that actually our international system needs serious uh, overhaul, that might be disappointing, right? Uh, what Bresden is saying. So, um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, end that there. Uh, let, let me see if I answered the question first. Uh, my question is, is, is China still reluctant to date the final strategy? Well, I think we talked about them, them going out more, right? They have this. Uh, yeah, they do seem to be getting more 
uh, engaged, I'm going to say, right? Uh, if you were very worried about China threat, you might say aggressive. You know, they have a, they're, they're developing a blue water navy, right, that can operate throughout the Indian Ocean. They're, they're going out from themselves, right? They, 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 they're, they're claiming the South China Sea, that they're gradually uh, going out from themselves. Um, that might be threatening to some, to some people. Um, not to Breslau, I think, not as threatening to Breslau. Um, so are they, are they doing that? Are there other lessons that great powers can learn in an effort to obtain a more positive global role? Uh, you know, if you think, you might think it's more positive for, for you know, state sovereignty. Hey, you leave those Iraqis alone, leave the Libyans alone, leave the, the Syrians alone, let them get on with it in their own country. It's not none of our business. Uh, if you uh, are a state sovereignty uh, kind of a person, then you're going to look at China and you're going to say, yeah, this is actually what China's bringing the world is perhaps better. Uh, than the intervention, right? Than the, the, the uh, if you're in that vein of anime called adventurism, right? The adventurism of the United States that goes in uh, and sticks its nose in in places where it's it's not wanted or warranted, uh, then you might think that this is a that China's a more positive global role model. Um, but there is a lot of fear out there, definitely. If you look at, um, they do a lot of these surveys. Maybe I'll try and find a survey and link that. As well, so I've got two things I should write them down. I'm going to do the, the correlates of war where you see China's power uh, rising above the United States power, and then I'll, I'll see if I can find one of those surveys that, that I sometimes look at where it, it, it's like a world attitude survey uh, and it, it talks about, um, you know, who would you rather have as the global hegemon, the United States, China, Russia, you know, and then people, just normal people answer it, and you, you, uh, you get to see what, what sort of the people of the world think. Uh, whether they think it's a positive uh, role or not. So I'll do those two things. I'm going to go now and do them. Uh, hopefully, uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope that you uh, got some information that you're pointed back to the Breslin reading and, and maybe uh, go back to the Breslin reading uh, in light of this video and in light of the questions and, and see if you can answer the questions for yourself. Um, I think that would be a great practice for the essay in the midterm uh, and for the final. Uh, although Breslin won't be on the final, but uh, he may well be on the midterm, so that's the, that's the benefit of reading just a few articles. If you read them well, uh, and you read them closely, and maybe read them a couple of times, uh, it, it, the, the essays in the midterm are going to be a breeze because you're going to know, okay, if I know Breslin really well, then I'm going to be able to say quite a lot in the in, in the essay. So uh, that's definitely my uh, my advice to you, and it's not just Breslin, right? Anything that we've read. You can probably expect a question about it, and so uh, if you know them well, uh, then you'll do well in the midterm. All right, I'm definitely I'm definitely ending this now. Uh.